What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Prototopics podcast episode. I am very surprised at how like I landed that. The, the <laughs> thumbs up. That was We've been practicing. Finger guns landed right on time. Welcome back. We have another uh, exciting episode with you here today. Uh, this is, I believe, episode either eight or nine of the podcast. We've been doing this for a while. It feels like we've been doing it for a while. You know, I, I, we keep talking about it. We're going to keep talking about it because I can't wait to to say this when we reach podcast 21 and then we've reached the top 1% of all podcasts ever oh, made. Yeah. <laughs> so we're exciting. Gonna, yeah, I that's we're on track right now. Like once we do podcast 21, we are in the top 1% of all podcasts ever made ever. Listen, I'm going to get party hats and probably some of those like the streamers, the streamers or I'll borrow uh Tom's kazoo. Uh, you know, we might bring him on and just just to do the kazoo. But uh, Isaac, what kind of topics are we going to talk about today? Oh, man, this one's going to be really exciting. And, and I think this one's probably going to be the most fun that we've done so far, because we're going to talk about Tesla, the future of driving robo taxis. We're going to talk about the movies. And is this the year that movies make a big comeback? I mean, no. you've seen it kind of <laughs> well, we we can hope wishful thinking, right? So we're going to talk about to-go orders and, you know, the different variations of to-go orders with fast food. We're going to circle it back around to just keep that conversation going about now that the uh, rate has increased month over month for the minimum wage in California for fast food workers. We're going to look at how that's actually taking course. And we got a lot of other exciting topics, too. So. Personally, I want to start out with one where we can just nerd out, rock out, and have a great time. Yes. So we were actually right before this talking, and and David just basically said, no, 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 sh shut up, shut up, politely, shut up. We need to talk about this for everybody else. So we're going to nerd out for a little bit, and we're going to talk about Tesla and some of the really cool things that's that's going on over there. So the first one that we're going to talk about, and we'll, we'll keep the conversation going with some different uh, avenues after, is going to be the... Robo taxi. So, David, taxi. Oh, I put in the little chat here cyber taxi, and that is not okay. correct. That is it not is correct. Robo taxi. There My mistake. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I, I the idea of having a, a simulated taxi, you know, I, I think this is going to cripple the Uber and lift markets. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Or they were going to have to buy into it. I, I, I just from the from the business aspect, I can't wait to see how this plays out. How is it going to upset the economics of of the taxi marketplace right now? Because it's already so expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, like even it doesn't matter where you are. Anywhere in the United States, you, if you're getting an Uber, you're getting a Lyft. You're feeling that price. You're feeling that price tag, no matter what it is, because. Even if you're going a few miles and it's and it's fourteen dollars, like that's still fourteen dollars to go a few miles. Here, where I am, it's typically fifty to sixty dollars for me to go anywhere. Oh yeah, of to to go anywhere of, of like interest, right? And that's not going very far. That's because this place is very very far away. Things are far away here. And but that's you're what also happens. Very close to a big city. I mean, it's I'm, you're not in I'm, the middle of nowhere by any means. Absolutely. I, I'm in the city. Like I am on the edge of the city. I'm right along the outskirts. So even being in city the city, too. we're not we're not even just saying it's like any smaller city. Like even when I was in New York, right, and I was just outside of Albany, that's a capital city, but it's a smaller uh, one of the capital cities like you're in a relatively decently sized capital city. Yes. So for it to be 50 to $70, 50 to $60 to get anywhere of interest. And that's only one way, is it not? That's one way. So you're looking yeah. at double that. So if I'm to right. go to the airport, it's, and, and it's just, it's going to be $60 if I'm leaving in at night right. or if I'm going to the airport at all, it's guaranteed to be around 50 to $60, yeah. 60 typically anywhere after 6 PM. Right. So it's it's I want to see how is that going to affect this marketplace? Are Uber and Lyft going to lower prices? And then but then that's going to make the drivers. They're not going to be afford to keep up with this. Mm -hmm. I, so what we're looking at is the future of a lot of people's jobs being affected. 
Oh, yeah. This is going to, I think, dump the entire taxi market on its head. We we think like uh, just a few years ago, you got Gary Vaynerchuk he constantly online. Now, for those of you who don't know, he's like a, a kind of a marketing guru. A lot of valuable information he used to drop. But he would say, well, I had the chance to invest in Uber and I didn't. Okay, well, that's what he was saying then, right? That's, so this is a guy who could have bought into Uber when it was starting. He'd be, you know, a quasi, quasi, whatever, millionaire, billionaire mm-hmm. right now if he had. Fast forward to now. What's the robo-taxi going to do to those companies? Is Uber going to become worthless now? Is Lyft going to become worthless now? Are right. you going to be seeing a mass exodus of drivers? Is there going to be a call to for unionization uh, for those drivers so that they can try and take care of themselves a little bit. Will Uber and Lyft start doing things like accommodating for gas? Like, what are the businesses going to have to do to keep drivers interested? What, you know, yeah. what are what are they going to do there? Because when the robo taxi hits, unless the robo taxi is part of the Uber and Lyft model, I don't see how the drivers are going to stay afloat. I don't see how those companies are going to stay afloat. Right. Right. So I'm going to take a a slightly different approach and I'm going to look through a historical lens, right? Because now we're talking about is, you know, what's the impact it's going to have in the future? Let's go back, right? Let's go back a hundred years ago. Uber's not a new concept. Uber actually did exist in like the 1915 region. And you might not have ever heard this. So if you haven't, just stand with me. This is new to me. Okay. Uber originally was a company or an idea called Jitney. J I T N E Y. What'd you call it? P- a J. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. Bless you. So it was it was a historical um, thing for the taxi industry called a jitney. So when people say like I'll be there in a jiff, it's actually a play on I'll be there in a jit, and it's a jitney, and it was fifteen cents, and you could get anywhere in a city. So the idea of a jitney no, was now it's actually jiffy like peanut butter, which exactly. is slow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you could get anywhere in a city for 15 cents and it was really, really valuable. The um, political powers that be decided to regulate it out of commission. And that's something that Elon Musk cited when he was initially going through this entire process. And even Travis Kalnick, which was the one of the original founders or you know one of the original CEOs for uh, Uber that met with with uh, Gary Vee, as you had just mentioned, yeah. he talked about that. They mentioned the Jitney and how that was the one that was like the predecessor and pushed it forward. Fast forward to where we are right now. We have Uber, we have Lyft, we have Via. And those are all like human-based drivers where you get into a car with a human driver. Right. But now let's look at it from a future perspective, right? We talked about the past. We talked about where we are today. Let's talk about where it's going. In Austin right now, Austin over the last probably five years has become a very technologically advanced city where there's major tech companies. Google is here. Tesla is here. Um, you know, Dell is here. Oracle is here. There's a lot of dollars being put into really incredible technologies in the Austin area. It's when the I new first Silicon came, Valley. It is. It pretty much is. And what's really impressive about it is the first time that I was ever here, I was driving down the down the road, and I th- I saw what I thought was a, a Google streetcar with the cameras on the top. And the reason I thought it was a Google streetcar is it had all the cameras, and what they do is they go around, they take pictures as to what you know as Google Street View. So when you go onto Google Maps, you can actually see like a realistic version of what all these roads look like. Well, what I realized as I pulled up next to it at a red light was it's not a Google street view. It's a company called cruise and it is a fully self-driving taxi. There is no one in the front of the car. There are two people sitting in the back of the car and it drives itself completely on its own. Now it has to stay within the Austin city limits, but it is a fully self-driving taxi that already exists. So now we, we look at the progression, right? Jitney was, uh, regulated out of commission then Uber and Lyft come back. All of the taxi drivers get upset. They add regulations. Then Elon Musk actually created an app where you can get a, a Tesla uh, Uber now. You can basically request a Tesla to come and pick you up. And it is actually significantly cheaper in a lot of major cities. Really? But now, now that he's focusing on full self-driving vehicles, 
this one is going to be really, really impressive. The robo taxi is going to be able to regulate costs. I think we could see the death of surge pricing potentially because he's not a money guy. He's, you know, like he's got money. That's not the focus. The focus is how do we help improve humanity? I, well, I, I don't know if we're going to see the death of surge pricing. I think that's I, I think that's here to stay because corporate greed is, has no bounds. You know, Uber and Lyft are certainly going to keep using it. Well, I, okay, it, the death of surge pricing in the driving industry in relation to the robo taxi. It might not be you know surge pricing. It might be get from one end of town to the next it, for thirty dollars flat rate for forty dollars flat rate, and they've got the. Um, the machine to be able to keep making these vehicles more and more and more of them. And as the full self-driving capabilities come about, we can continue to see more opportunity where they create a car, no driver required, send the signal. This is where I need you to pick us up. Go. So it's, it's really exciting to, to see, but like the technology has been tested for a, a number of years. And now we're seeing it's just coming more and more to fruition I think we could see uh, Uber and Lyft really struggle because we're already seeing that as, you know, and we're going to talk about this topic later on, but we talked about the um, increase in minimum wage in California for fast food workers. You're, you're crazy if you think that that growth or that hike in minimum wage was only going to stay in the fast food industry. It's right. going to trickle down to all of these different industries. We're already seeing Uber and Lyft saying that they're going to remove their services entirely from major cities where the drivers are demanding rate hikes. Right. So we're seeing it. It's even within the last two days in like You're the North mid East Detroit, um, Chicago, you know, all of these major cities that are up there, they're saying, unless you pay us more money, we're not going to keep working for you. And they're saying, we're just going to remove all of the services that are even offered there. Yeah. It, and to take it to the next step, you're going to have upset people on the side of the drivers, mm -hmm. but you're also going to have upset people on the side of the consumers. Oh, yeah. It's going to be cheaper for these companies to run automated taxi services, but they Absolutely. are going to they're going to either charge the same or what I think is most likely they're going to raise their rates. I think rates are going to continue to rise. And so they're going to be paying less because, again, it, it all comes back to, you know, profits, stock value. And I think you're going to see like, yeah, I, at first it's going to be like, oh, wow, you know, we have a robo taxi now. But I, I'm, I'm still thinking because I don't think Elon is in and I could be dead wrong. I don't think Elon's in the in, interested in killing Uber. I don't think so. I think he's interested in selling cars to Uber. I honestly, after everything that I've read and seen about him, I think that he trusts himself to run the most efficient business. I, uh, I think, yeah, he's definitely full of himself enough with that. <laughs> Whoa. All right, buddy. Let's take it back enough. He's got like 18 companies that he's the and they're head all of worth billions of dollars. They're, I mean, I, if you trust anybody, I, I, it's, it's just like, how many more can this man fit under his belt? That's where I'm just like, all right, Disney, if he was going, going. I mean, well, look, what's the, what's the, the, what's the limit that Elon can handle being the head chair business owner of, right? How many, how many can he go for, you know? And I, I just, I, maybe i maybe I'm wrong and I'll, I'll take the L. I don't have a problem but with you that. Admitted that. Thank you. If, Moving on. <laughs> if he, if he goes ahead and says, I'm starting the robo taxi company to take out Uber, like, Okay. I, I'm interested to see how it goes. I look forward to paying less money to get around. And you know what? Everybody else is too. But I don't I don't think his, uh, to your point, I don't think his goal is to get rid of Uber or Lyft or, you know, these other competitors. I think it's the safety of drivers. He is a data company. They are not a car company. They right. have millions and millions of cars on the road that are collecting billions and billions of data points a month. With all of this data, it is statistically proven that it is safer to have cars driving than people because the cars and the machines driving themselves have a quicker response time. They have tons of data and they can be put in situations that humans would never have thought of, but because one car did it somewhere else, now they get to benefit from it. When a human is driving, there's impairments from you know maybe alcohol, 
maybe drugs, maybe it's a rainy night. You've never experienced it before. I just watched a video of a Tesla the other day where they started to hydroplane and the, cus- the, the driver was freaking out and the car automatically repositioned it back on the highway and it was going straight. So there's, there's a lot of really cool things that are happy, happening with this. But as far as the robo-taxis, I think the idea here is that it's safer to have people um, in, at the hands of a machine than it is at the hands of themselves, especially because there are a lot of bad drivers, whether or not they want to admit it. I'm just, I'm just thinking of all the uh, situations that I've been in in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Woo, true, yeah. <laughs> Accident with a deer, slid oh, yeah. down an ice mountain, uh, another accident that wasn't yeah. fun. That was all just <laughs> December, January, February. So, I, look, I've said it on this show before. I want the self-driving car. I just don't want the robot in the house. Right. I'm co- Give me the self-driving car, please. Yeah. Okay? That being said, I think I'm a good driver. <laughs> Well, you're okay. <laughs> I'm a, you are, I'm, you're a New York City driver, nonetheless. I'm a New York City driver, and I know there's people in the chat who are like, David's a horrible driver in video games. Ah. I am not good in video games. <laughs> and he's okay in real life, so I am, take that. Yes, I'm okay in real life. <laughs> unless it's so, 4 a.m. and it's deer that's, season. That's fair. <laughs> so, listen, we, we got the robo-taxis, and that's great. Another thing that I just want to nerd out on for just a little while is yes. the Cybertruck. Yes. The Cybertruck, it, it pains me to say this, but you are right the way that you said it earlier. It, it, it I, does I, I, look like it was drawn by an eight-year-old. It does. It looks like it, it looks like an eighth grader's and, like presentation, uh, like their science project. And they're like, I know. Can you, this can is you my car. For this, please? I am doing it right now. Okay. So, yes, it does. However, I have had the the fortunate pleasure of living less than 20 minutes away from where they are manufactured. And I see them all the time. Look at this. And I speak with, dude, (laughs) look at that. How can you not? It is just so pretty. This is the black version, folks. Yes. Which I just learned this exists like five minutes before we went live. Yes. I just saw one of these the other day driving around for the first time. This is incredible. This is absolutely designed by an eighth grader or ninth grader science project. It's like, this is my electric car. This is like I just <laughs> fully believe. You don't I'm, deserve one, okay? I <laughs> guess I don't. Okay, I, I guess not. I've been a fan of the Cybertruck. I watched Day Zero when they announced that it was coming, and he threw the lead ball at the window, and it broke. So I, I almost put a hundred dollars in right then to reserve my spot to get one. Has that been resolved yet? Yes, that's the ones that they're selling out right now. So they're giving oh. them to all the reserves. No, I mean like they're like it's been resolved like it doesn't break anymore when you throw a lead ball at it the reason that it broke was because they put the window down and they were hitting the door with a sledgehammer and as everybody knows with tempered glass when you get a small crack in the edge it breaks the structural integrity of the entire thing yes they hit the door when the sledgehammer or when the window was down and they chipped the edge of it so then when they threw it the structural integrity was already gone which is why it broke interesting so that's the real reason why um but i mean aerodynamics this is amazing i spoke with someone the other day who actually has one of these and he said i will never drive another vehicle again as long as i can handle it the uh the turning capabilities the technology like take the look away from it a bit and just look at the statistics or not not the statistics the um accolades of this thing the towing capacity is crazy the battery life is amazing. The um, off off roading that you can do with this thing is insane. And like I've seen videos of of these towing like thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. Which like if you're a truck guy, you might say like that's really not a lot. I've seen major things get towed by this, and it's very very impressive. Up mountains, even starting at zero, they still have an incredible pickup and acceleration like the other Teslas. But on top of that. A lot of the technology that they have in here, because Elon Musk really like he he files patents, but he keeps them relatively open for other people to use as well. A lot of the technology that he's putting in these cars, they end up in other cars like a year or two later. 
So like, even if you don't love the look of this, the technology and the boundaries that he pushed by creating something like this, we're seeing other people try to do it. Rivian, which is another electric truck company, is trying to do something very similar. Their cars look the same. That line in the front with the light all the way across, I've seen that on some more like hybrid Volkswagens now. So it's, I mean, everything that he's doing, it's just, it's very, very impressive. He's got the understanding for design, but at the same time, he wanted something that looks different and it looks different. And if you don't want one, don't get it. Oh, I, I've seen the Rivian car. Is that a new company? It is. Yeah, Rivian it's came new- out probably about two years ago, three years ago. All right, ago. so I, I saw a car that looked like this and I was like, that's not from that's not from planet the, earth if you look at the, the <laughs> headlights they're very circular they look goofy yeah they do they it's they very look weird goofy. and they have tons of them here and I, I see them all the time and uh the problem with rivian is that the yeah look at this it's so weird but like i, I so i saw a car it wasn't a truck just just commonly driving it was one of their other cars and i saw it and i'm like they're trying to copy tesla oh yeah Absolutely. They have a Jeep version of this. They've got the truck version of this. I don't know that I've seen a car, but they have a lot of different versions of it. The headlight looks goofy. It but looks it's, goofy. It's, you know what it is, though? And, and I think this is important. When we look at trucks, like my dream truck is like a 1982 to a 1985 uh, Chevy Silverado. They're gorgeous. It was a boxy series. It's, you know, it's wonderful. All of the trucks nowadays look like this and they look very round and they look very like childish and kiddish and all that kind of stuff i feel like elon musk with that design was just like you know what i just want something different give me something different and whether or not you like it that's fine but what it does do is it commands your attention just just look at here i'm going to show this picture and just like kind of squint your eyes for a second tell me that this doesn't look like a cartoon character (laughs) it does (laughs) It does. Like, just look I mean, at it. Like, squint your eyes a little bit and tell look. me those aren't eyes. And the mouth. It's got the tell, mouth. Tell me that's not, like, getting ready to say ka <laughs> This is like This is like the 1990s, like, big comfy couch. Like, it looks like, you know, there was that trend <laughs> where people would just glue googly eyes to things, like, two yes. years ago. They just glued googly eyes to the front of the truck. It's and- on the angle where the headlights look like eyes. They look right. like cartoon eyes. Yes. So yeah. very, very weird. But you know what? You know, power to them, I guess. They're they're doing okay. They've had <laughs> problems because they have had to recall so many of their vehicles. Uh oh. Um, but they're they're pushing forward, they're forging ahead. So I think Robotaxi is gonna be really interesting to see how it plays out. It, it, Elon Musk himself is known for over promising and under delivering. In some cases, he's also known for um continuing to push the envelope because of those over promises i saw an article that he is looking to have the robo taxi by the end of the calendar year 2024 so i that's obviously not mass manufactured you're not going to see it everywhere by then but, but the project he's hoping completed. to at least project complete there is one working of that yeah uh, and, and i could see it being realistic with all the, the data that they already have i think the robo taxi is going to put the a lot of things up on its head it's gonna it's gonna flip the bucket over on a lot of things and i don't know if that's gonna be good i know like obviously it's gonna be great but i don't know if it's gonna be good for everybody else right from a business position it's awesome i want that but i want it from a consumer base i want it myself i don't want to put hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people out of work which is what i think sure. is about to happen oh i'll just and quick just uh, uh for personally there was for a time this year i've been taking a lot of ubers around here Mm -hmm. every one of them i talk to they are in a bad financial place oh yeah (laughs) they are not in a good financial spot and i'm just like yeah yeah you keep keep at it and so (laughs) i i just don't want those folks that are already it's like most of the people that turn to uber and turn to these driving companies for for work is they need work right and what's gonna happen when this comes around you know there it's charlie and the chocolate factory folks they replaced uh mr bucket with the machine but at the end he had to become the engineer fixing the machine 
Yep. I don't I don't think all these people are going to become engineers overnight like in the no. the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie. So that's just keeping that in mind. So we talked a, a lot about in this in this topic about um change and like change to a market, change to you know what could be or how it's going to go. I want to transition this from the the auto industry to the movie and cinema industry, right? Yes. So we we have an article and uh, if you want to pull it up, that would be awesome. It's about um, AMC Theater. Now, before we dive too far into this, AMC Theater was actually a really uh, hot stock, we'll say, when the Wall Street bets situation was happening in 2021 area. So this one is about the CEO of AMC Theater saying that it would be inconceivable that AMC would file for Chapter 11. Now, if you don't know what Chapter 11 is, it's a form of bankruptcy. There's various different chapters, and you know we're not going to go into the logistics of that. And uh, Adam Aaron is basically saying it's inconceivable that that would even happen, basically meaning it is completely in no world, no way, shape, or form realistic that AMC would file for a form of bankruptcy. Now, this seems so crazy to me because this we seems saw- This seems pompous. It does. It it's almost so feels pompous. like- it almost feels like uh, there's a really famous quote by Ken Olson, and he ran a technology company during the time where Apple was originally starting. And he was saying there is no world that in which we live in where every single person has a PC, a personal computer, in their home. This is this is the business equivalent to sniffing his own farts. I, I'm like, oh, this, is, oh, this is I. <laughs> I mean, that's that's it. That's what this guy's doing. I can't take this guy seriously. The movie theaters are closing rapid, rapid fire speed all over America, all oh, over yeah. the world. Movie theaters are closing. AMCs are closing. How is it inconceivable that AMC would go? It would not go bankrupt. I right. don't take you seriously. I think you're full of crap. I, I mean, I don't know when the last time you saw a movie is, but I went to see one uh, at the end of last month. And I I told my wife, like, we need to get there early. We need to get there ahead of time because I think they're going to be sold out. She hyped this movie up to me for months and months and months. It was one of her favorite actors. The actor was here in Austin, you know, for the world premiere. I figured that would draw some good, you know, good taste. People would say, oh, they were just here. I want to go and meet them. Also, it was a movie that had Sydney Sweeney, which is one of the hottest, you know, new actresses in Hollywood. And now she's going on the thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the movie had maybe six people in the whole theater. Like I walked in and I thought there was no one there. And then I saw a, a couple up in the top and I said, we just got free tickets because we didn't want you guys to be alone. So they sent us in with you. Wow. We left. One other couple came in before the movie started, and that was it. There were six people watching this movie. I guarantee you it cost more for the electricity for that specific one room than the ticket price than they made during that time. I, I'm not buying it. I'm just not buying it. No, right. people, people don't. There's this big discussion that, oh, well, people don't want to go to movie theaters anymore. That's not true. That's not true because of the success that some movies make. There are mm. some movies that kill it. Look at Godzilla and Kong just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Blew the lid off the box office. It was still number one in Weekend 2. Okay. It made its money back in full, and it's it's a success. Godzilla vs. Kong is a success. Dune 2 did okay. Mm. Everything else is not making money. Well, why is that? Does it have to do with the fact people don't want to go to movies, which is just not true? Or is it the fact the movies aren't good? Yeah. It's the movies aren't good. People don't want to pay. It's expensive to go to the movies. Look, if it's just, if it's like Isaac, for you, it's you and your wife. If it's sure. me, it's just me. That's affordable. You know, right. for us, it's not a big deal. We're also, I don't know about, I don't know about, you, you know, you and your wife, but I'm not a popcorn guy. So I don't really, I don't snack out. So for me, I'm looking at like twenty dollars to see a movie. Sure, not the end of the world. It's just me. What about a family with 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 two kids? Right, three kids. You're looking at a hundred dollar day. 
Yeah. You're looking at a hundred dollar outing on just tickets. But I also, I like to break it down and I don't know that everybody does this, but I always do because I was raised in like a, you know, like a, a lower small town American, you know, class family. Um, I think about things hourly, right? A hundred dollars for a 90 to 120 minute film. That's an hour and a half to two hours. A hundred dollars for two hours of your time. That's why I can justify spending $70 on almost any video game. And I remember the first time I ever had this thought was for the Wii. I said, I really want to get Mario Kart for the Wii. It's $50. And with it being $50, I can justify that because I'm going to spend so much time doing it. These movies are like so expensive because they need to be in order to meet their overhead. But the, their quality is not good. You brought up Dune 2. I haven't seen it, but I tried to watch Dune two days ago. I Halfway through the movie, I had two thoughts. One, I can tell they spent a lot of money because the, the CGI and the animation and graphics here is really good. Two, I have no idea what is going on. It felt like they took like Maze Runner and Star Wars and threw them together but just like change the story enough that they could add another name to the movie. I have zero idea what happened and I will probably never try to watch it again. Yeah. I, I as well. So just fun fact, Dune came before both of those. So there was, the I know of, there's the, the old version of it. The, I watched the new one. I so mean I the book, the there was, finally. it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Dune is a book series. And I think it's, it's like the first three are the best ones. And sure. so that's Dune 1, 2, and now they're going to do Dune... I believe it's Dune 3. I didn't read the books. I didn't see the movies. But those properties inspired things like Star Wars and, to an extent, Maze Runner. But, well, then I'm um, going to say this real quick, directly into the camera. For you guys at home, if you decide to read the book, the first one is boring. Start on <laughs> book two. <laughs> it was the, terrible, dude. The dude I watched hate. like an hour of it. It's two and a half hours. I oh, watched like I... an hour and 30 minutes. And I was like, I turned to Stacy and I said, do you care if I turn this off? And she's like, not even a little bit. Yeah. Turn it off. I, I, <laughs> it doesn't matter at all. I'm sorry. I saw the trailer for Dune 1 and I thought, okay, they're setting up for a trilogy. This movie's going to go nowhere. I'm not seeing yeah. it. I'll see you at the end of the Dune, the third Dune movie, and I'm going to watch them all. I don't have the patience to watch crap anymore. I also don't have the time. Like I don't. I just don't yeah. have the time when it's like it's crap. But you know what? You know who else doesn't have time? Everyone else. Yes. You know, everyone else. You you, you just exactly. you don't have time for bad product anymore. And I think that there is this there's this problem with Hollywood and Hollywood writers and Hollywood actors and just the creative. Hollywood sphere that they think that they're untouchable. They think they're mm -hmm. unbreakable. And the truth is, no one is untouchable. You, you, yeah. you, you put out bad product, the market talks, and the market will continue to talk about movie theaters. So for, uh, what's his name? Aaron? Uh, yeah, um, Aaron Adam. Adam yes. Aaron. Adam, uh, Aaron. To Adam Aaron here to come out and say that his company, it is inconceivable for it for why, why even go down that route now clearly this is in discussion just by reading the headline and reading the article this is th about the discussion on the box office woes 2023 was not the greatest year for the box office all of disney movies were colossal failures you look at this year they're saying that this year is going to be even below last year so mm -hmm. i gotta give him a little bit of credit in that He's trying to defend his stock value. That is his job. He is the CEO. So he has to say, like, it's not going to affect us, even if he's lying through his teeth. And we're all supposed to pretend like he's telling the truth. Right. Because that's just how business goes. But for him to say that, there's no chance. There's movie theaters closing every single day. There are channels here on, on YouTube that tell you, hey, if you've got nothing to do this weekend, go support your local theater. Local though, not that's not local AMC. Correct. Go support your local theaters. Yes. You know the ones in in your in your towns the that are not these AMC chains that are not these Regal chains. Mm -hmm. You know th this is the same management for AMC that thought it was going to be a good idea to do a pricing structure change on the seats themselves, so that depending on where you sit, it's more expensive. Yeah. And I don't know if that's still in effect, but I don't go to I don't go to AMC. I go to Regals. Uh, regardless, 
He's he, he, he this is a a, a full of crap point. <laughs> yeah. I just I I completely disagree. You know, maybe you're going to see there's a there's the Deadpool and Wolverine film coming out this year. That'll probably do very well. I can't name any other movies that are coming out this year that I think I'm even looking forward to and I'm the movie guy. Right. Well, I think a lot of that also ties into what we saw last year, which was the the strike. We knew that that strike was going to have a lasting impact on the movie industry. Yes. And, and it and put a pause on so much. Fun fact. So, and I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast, but we've talked about it, is the yeah. job rates of March and how we saw that there was a there was a decline. It, where did all the jobs go in March, right? Right. Uh, where did it not go? Writers. Mm-hmm. There's the, the the writers are woo. They're they're letting writers go left and right. They argued in the strike for all of these things that they want, and they thought that they were going to have control. They think they have the upper hand, and now they're not getting hired anymore. Right. It's. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying I agree with that. We're not saying that we agree with any of these major corporations. But when you try to fight them, you got to fight them smart. And I, yeah. I'm, I'm not too sure that that was the greatest strategy because now you've you've wounded the industry that you you are uh, advocating that you're going to be really great in. Right? This year is not going to be good for Hollywood. This year is not going to be good for the box office. Next year may not be as well because we're you're still dealing with the ramifications of, like Isaac said, of that strike, which went on yeah. for far too long. It went on for a very long time. And then the the question becomes, and it's a very real question, how long can you sustain these lower numbers? Because inflation is rising and inflation's not just on like a one-on-one level. It also affects and impacts businesses. So with that being the case, it's like how many bad years in succession can you have? Because even though 2023 is lower, right? 2020 was a bad year. 2021 was a bad year. 2022, it was better, but still not great. 23 was a slow year. 24, we're dealing with a year that's going to be worse than 23. And 25, we're dealing with the the spillover from all of the, um, all of the strikes. I, I want to follow that point up. You know, how long can it sustain? Well, where's the root of that problem? Where's the root of the problem? In, in talking about just just pivoting for a second because I thought it was a really good point. Disney with the whole the Disney board vote recently you had Nelson sure. Peltz was on record and he said I want to have the exact quote why do I have to have a Marvel that's all women not that I have anything against women but why do I have that uh, why can't I have Marvels that are both why do I need an all black cast I want to follow up with why shouldn't you why shouldn't you be able to make you know, an all women cast movie why shouldn't you be able to have an all black cast movie I think those are okay why do they all cost so much? Why yep. does all of these move? That's the problem here is that all of it costs too much. And so because the it's it has ballooned out of control, the spending has ballooned out of control. So now you're throttled on what you can make, but then you're also trying to check a bunch of boxes to keep everybody happy. But then no one's spending money on this because they're voting with their dollar and they're not interested in what you create anymore. And so we get to the problems like we're looking at now, where now the theaters are all closing. Mm-hmm. And it all goes back to why is what's the root of the problem? The root of the problem is not that uh, you have an all black cast in the Black Panther movies. The problem is, is you're spending too much money to make all of the movies. Oh, all yeah. of the movies cost too much. Why was Godzilla a success? And how do we know that it it broke even and made money already? The Godzilla versus Godzilla Kong. Uh, because they had released what the what the what it cost to make it, and it was significantly less than mm-hmm. what most of the major motion pictures cost to make right now. Okay, right. Indiana Jones was around three hundred thirty million dollars to make. That means it would have needed close, close to eight hundred million dollars to break even. Because the way that the, that it that it works, you're looking at whatever the initial cost is to make it multiply that by basically 2.5 mm-hmm. 
-hmm. This is what all of the everybody does in the box office industry. You multiply that by 2.5 for marketing. That's how much it costs for marketing. Yeah. So you get so it's so it's not marketing is not in that 330 million to make it. No, no, no. It's mostly it's it's double that. So you need right. more than double that to market the film worldwide. You're not just marketing it like a like a simple Facebook or Google ad. You're marketing it all over the world in different languages, different cultures, commercials. Every all of that is millions and millions of dollars. So I, you know, this this is this is a continuing point. I think you're seeing a shift in the entertainment industry. I think you're seeing apathy setting in across the board. People just don't care anymore. But when, when we, we live in a world where of the successful franchises that exist right now, there are really only two or three. And Godzilla is one of them. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. <laughs> Superman, the DC films were was not successful. Transformers yeah. is no longer successful. Harry yeah. Potter is no longer successful. Star Wars is no longer successful. Marvel is dying. But it's still successful, but it's dying. But Godzilla is the, is the king of the movies right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't believe that that's the world we're living in today. I think one of the things that's important, though, to, to dive into about that is creativity, right? I think a lot of these companies, when they get successful, they think that the way to continue the success is spend more money, do more effects. The writing is garbage. The writing is what kills it. It's always the so writing. Like, I mean, how did they used to make movies? They used to make movies in like two or three days. Yeah. And they would just record stuff and they would do, you know, little editing here and there. And as time progressed and they got to do more and more and time went on, they started to add a little effect here, a little effect there, you know, here and there. That's all good and well. The stories were so much better written. So with, you know, these ones being horrible writing, you can't cover up horrible writing by adding new effects to it. It just doesn't work. So we, we look at, you know, some of the most creative people and where do we find them? YouTube. We find them on shorts. We find them with people that are putting in the work to go onto YouTube to build an audience. They get subscribers. And like, we'll talk about, you know, we talk about Mr. Beast and I'm not like a huge Mr. Beast fan, but he just does it really well. We can talk about Mr. Beast. We can talk about, you know, Ludwig. We can talk about, you know, all of these different well-known people. They are just creative people and they create videos that people want to watch and they're they're enticing and they don't cost as much. They might, you know, Mr. Beast, right? How much money does he spend on a video? He did the Squid Games redo. Now, if you've never seen Squid Games, it was obviously the most watched uh, Netflix, Netflix show Netflix. of all times. Mr. Beast came and recreated it. What was his intention? Two million dollars in spend. That's still going to be a milla fraction of what it cost Netflix to do it. Right. Then he said, we really overspent on our budget there. How much was it? Actually, 4.5 million. But it doubled the views of Netflix. Yeah. He literally redid what they did, but better for less than a tenth of the cost. And, you don't and, have to put that much money into it. And that's where you're seeing now there's there's YouTubers have been the ones talking about this for the long time because they see the writing on the wall. Yeah. But now Hollywood is starting to realize it. Not yep. a, not nearly enough, and the, and it's the kind of thing of like they're, oh yeah, that that could be a threat. So they're not internalizing that it actually is a serious threat. Right. Uh, where does all of the attention go now? It's not going to the news anymore. It's not going to the media anymore. Nobody gives a, gives a crap about what celebrities are saying anymore. People right. care what YouTubers are saying. People care what TikTokers are saying and doing. And um, these are just average Joes. Mm -hmm. These are just average folks with a camera and a microphone who happen to be good at articulating and are good at being persuasive to attract an audience. Right. And so, yeah, that is a massive threat. And you know what you're seeing from that? And we've, I talk about this often. We talk about this on the show, on, on here on the podcast. Those that are smart turn their brand into an actual business. Oh, yeah. And we see it all the time. We've talked about it here. We've got uh, people like the critical drinker who who just originally was critiquing films and movies and now 
is producing them, making he's making his own movies. We see that with Eric July and the Repiverse. Originally, it was just critiquing and discussing comic books. Now he runs his own comic book company. Mm-hmm. We see this with uh, uh, Nerd Roddick, who just hit uh, a million subscribers here on YouTube. Originally, just talking about was was previously a comic book store owner. Started talking about comic books. Started talking about pop culture. Now is putting out his own book. And you're going to see more and more and more and more of that. And you know what? The people are already bought in. So when you put up a put up one of those products and it makes a million dollars in 24 hours, I can't say I'm surprised because you've already got people who are personally and emotionally invested into your success. They already like you. They already trust you. Can you yeah. say the same about Hollywood anymore? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Mission Impossible last year was a box office bomb. It did not make its money back. Now, that's not to say he hasn't had other failures in the past, but the point being is Dwayne Johnson. Dwayne Johnson has had box office bombs. Tom Cruise has had box office bombs. No one is untouchable. Hollywood is not mm-hmm. untouchable. Every one of Disney's Disney's movies bombed at the box office when they released last year. I will right. keep saying that, you know, in that because it's because it's it's true. It is it is just a truth, you know, elemental. It took it months to make its money back and break even. Mm-hmm. And that was the Pixar movie, and it just it it just lingered and eventually made enough to break even but we don't know how how successful it was now you know it's right. disappointing so yes youtube is is youtube and social media is the biggest threat to hollywood right now and i wish they'd realized that i wish they'd realized that before we change topics though i want to talk real quick about fallout isaac have you played any of the fallout games i played fallout 4 for about an hour and a half, and I was very confused on what I was supposed to do. Okay. And I turned it off, and I've never played again. Okay. But I do so, see, I see the, 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 I don't know, the icon or the logo of the kid. Like, oh, the, the yes. Astro the, Boy or the like vault the, guy with the thumbs yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. So you, that's the mushroom cloud. It's to see oh, if the okay. mushroom cloud is. Uh, I, I just, I want to talk about Fallout real quick because there is. A discussion around especially what we've just been saying uh, about creativity and the writers being the problem. Mm -hmm. So I've seen the first episode of Fallout, and it it does one thing right, and it does another thing totally wrong. The one thing it does right is that it honors the source material. Mm -hmm. It honors the games. It's very clearly, you, you watch this and you're like, yes, they played the games. They're honoring the source material. On the other hand, this episode is unsatisfying. It's an unsatisfying episode. That's my personal opinion. If you may agree with me, you may not. I, I'm not talking about it as like a fallout sh- as, as the show, like like the uh, um, the concept of the show. I'm a fallout fan. I played three and four. I like them. When that episode ends, I sat there thinking, I'm not attached to this at all. I don't really care. Yeah. I would not come back next week. Let me put it that way. Mm-hmm. That's a writing problem. That means you haven't done enough job to get me to buy in. So that's the same problem all the other shows have nowadays. They they write where it's a movie or it's a it's a single story that is then chopped into a hundred pieces and then stretched out over the course the, the course of however many episodes that they have and fallout here which came out l- last night is no different it's the same problem with other movies and shows well it's the same problem with other shows that we're seeing especially on streaming now i have i couldn't care less about watching episode two mm-hmm. the only reason i will watch episode two is because it's already all out but if i had to wait i wouldn't be coming back i it's, it's not for me i don't care yeah. And and there you think back even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the shows that were being released. You would watch an episode and then it would end in such a pivotal way that the episode itself, the story confined in that episode is complete in and of itself and yet there's still another story to tell next week. Mm-hmm. So there was a reason for you to come back next week. There was a, there was an interest. There was something for you to talk about around the water cooler. There was more stories to tell. 
Game of Thrones, the first season, was good at this. The Sopranos was good at this. There was enough in one episode to make you feel satisfied, like you got something out of it this week. And then there's enough to want to continue. I can't say that with any streaming show that I know of, other than maybe One Piece on Netflix, which is an anime, uh, um, live action anime show. Everything else, everything else is just these unsatisfying slogs. There are just these slog episodes that they, they eat up the clock. You don't feel very satisfied. And then we continue. And I, I just wanted to talk about that to end our AMC discussion because we talk about the theaters. It's the same problem with the streamers. And why, yep. why is Disney losing subscribers so rapidly? Netflix seems to gain subscribers, so they're doing something right. But don't, don't forget, they ended the password sharing, which radically changed the way a lot of people consume <laughs> Netflix. So now you got to put your dollar where your interest is for Netflix. Can you say the same about Disney? Can you say the same about Hulu or HBO Max or any of the other ones? I'm not so sure you can. Well, so you bring you bring up something super important though, because Netflix um, just changed what they're doing, where they are going to now introduce commercials. So it used to be, hey, get away from cable television because there's commercials, and you don't get to decide what you want. Now we have a system where we can pick what we want, but we still have commercials, even if you pay yes. for it. That was like one of the biggest selling points. We don't want commercials. So now these companies are, yes, their stock might be going up, but it's because they're now allowing commercials. This happened within two weeks ago. I used to have Netflix where I would never see a commercial. It was totally fine. I was watching it yesterday and I don't watch it that often, but I turned it on yesterday and a commercial popped up. Now for 90 seconds, I have to sit there and watch a commercial even though I'm paying for it. It's like all of these companies lost one of their most valuable possessions it almost makes me wonder if these large cable companies are going to come back and just say come back come back to us what's the reason for going to them and we might see a shift away from streaming back toward you know a more traditionalized cable system so I, I could explain that. So Netflix is starting to see the light at the end of the road. They're starting mm -hmm. to see the freight train at the end of the tunnel in that they're tapping out on consumers. Yeah, they're gonna, they're, There's only so many people that they can get around the planet to sign up, and they mm -hmm. think they know what that number is going to be. So how else can they make money? Otherwise, they're going to hit the ceiling. There's nowhere to go. There's no more people sure. to join. There's only down. There's no more up because once people are out, they have to release another show to get them to come back. And so there's, there's, that's it. They've hit the ceiling. They need to sell ads to continue bringing in money. Mm -hmm. To increase uh, profits, they to increase sales, and so they make more money when you are when you pay less and they show you ads. That's how ex that's how valuable and expensive advertising is on these on these streaming platforms. They would rather you at home pay less for your Netflix subscription, but you watch those ads because they will make significantly more money off of you. Absolutely. That's how it works. And that's insane to me. That really genuinely is. It all comes back to advertising and, and paid ads. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Well, that's one of those things where I wish we didn't have to have that. Obviously, I hate the ads portion of it, but I get it. I get why they're doing it that way. I understand. But one of the things that you mentioned when we were talking about the uh, AMC theaters is that, you know, the industry is being destroyed and it's being destroyed for a number of different reasons. And one of the industries that, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier that we were going to talk about it again, that's being destroyed like every single day destruction is occurring more and more is the fast food industry. So, you know, we <laughs> we had talked about it before it happened. We had said that the minimum wage was going to be going up in the state of California for limited service restaurants for some reason that don't have a bakery attached to them. Uh, I do want to shout out. And if there's, if you know, the person that said this is here with us today, please tell us this was the best idea I had. Every single fast food limited service should now just start baking one, one loaf of bread per day. 
and put it on their menu as a until sold out item. That seems genius. I mean, it seems like a great way to get around it. Would that actually ever work? I highly doubt it, but it, it's a very, very good idea. Uh, we're seeing entire businesses that have been around for 40, 50, 60 years, like legacy cornerstone restaurants shutting down now because they can't afford the increase and they can't afford the decrease in workmanship. So it's kind of like they're now put into this corner where the only option is to decrease. So David, you've, you've, you and I have talked about it before, but you've also seen some of the other things about businesses that are just shutting down completely. Do you think this was the intention? Do you think this is a positive? Do you think they should reverse on the, the increase? What are the thoughts? Uh, it's going to trickle across the country. It's what yeah. we said last time. It's what I still stand by. It's what I still believe is going to happen. It's going to trickle across the country. You're going to see this happen. Uh, it's going to hit places like New York, New York City, Chicago. They'll they'll get it next. Yeah. Um, whether it's a success or a failure, it'll still hit those those cities. It doesn't matter the way you see it. It'll happen in California first. And eventually, it'll hit everywhere else. Now, um, there are a lot of businesses closing. There are places that are being affected by this. One thing I want to point out, there's a video that we did here, uh, I want to say a week ago, talking about McDonald's, and there was the, the, one of the McDonald's franchisees was complaining, but then it was also noted that the guy owned 18 different McDonald's. Now, <laughs> probably that guy is well off, but Isaac, is that the example of no. most franchisees, and what does a typical franchisee look like of one of these businesses? Yeah, I would say the two biggest examples of franchisable businesses that you and I know of would be McDonald's and Subway. McDonald's and Subway are both franchise-based. Uh, for those of you that might not necessarily understand that, there's a corporate office that you pay a monthly fee to in exchange for the, uh, the logo, in exchange for the marketing material, in exchange for the product, the training, X, Y, and Z. So a person goes and buys a franchise license and becomes a franchisee for these different industries and these different locations. And then it's basically pay us a fee here. Here's what you have to do. Here's the set of rules you have to follow. This is the way that it's going to work. So at least with Subway, I know that the average owners of Subway own between one and two franchises of, or location of, Subway with McDonald's, maybe it's more like two or three, but they're, they're hard to get. It's not like it's just easy. So no. the thing is, these aren't people that are multi, you know, millionaires over millionaires, wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. They're maybe people that worked a little bit harder on the front end so that they could own it. And that's why I love seeing the success stories of people that they take a picture of their badge on day one and it's like custodian, then it's like line cook. And then it's like, you know, the headline cook. Then it's, you know, head of training, it's assistant manager, manager, owner. It's like they went through the entire system and worked their way up. I love seeing that. It feels like a really good success story because, you know, these aren't people that were just born into wealth. Someone that's got 18 has a much different perspective, but I would almost be willing to bet someone that has one, two or three of these franchises, they worked really hard to get it. Yeah. And they're I, doing everything they can to stay afloat. There is. And I... I there needs to be a distinction and there isn't in the media that right. franchise owners or franchisees are not the corporations, right? They're seen as the corporations. They're viewed as the corporations. They're not the corporations. So there, and, and, and there's a lot of, I almost want to say heartlessness around franchisees. And then you that the the average person lumps them in with the corporations like pff, they can pay more, can they? Right. Because it costs a fortune to open one of those. So yeah. you're looking at somebody who may have gone in on all of their, you know, uh, they may have gone they may have gone all in. They may have gone all in to to make this happen. And, it, and you see a lot of family businesses start up like this to open up a, opening up a bakery is not easy. Opening up a coffee right. house is not easy. It, I don't care if, if it's got a McDonald's name or not, but opening any business is not easy for anyone, 
money included already, even if you've got a little bit of money that you're going in on it. So I, I hate the stigma that uh, the business owners, well, they, they, could, they could pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we see that they're not. Uh, and the people in McDonald's, across, uh, the people in California, rather, are already just starting to shut down those operations so that we see businesses closing. But here's what else we're seeing. Uh, California just hiked minimum wage for fast food workers. Some restaurants are replacing them with kiosks. <laughs> bye bye. Right. As if we didn't expect this was going to happen. Now, granted, places like McDonald's have already been hedging against this by putting in those kiosks. Isaac, I don't know about you. I use the kiosk 10 out of 10 times whenever I go to a fast food place that has one. Do you? Honestly, no, because I like the social interaction. Even if it's just me and Gwendolyn on the other side, I love <laughs> talking to Gwendolyn. Like, it's just, it's fun for me. I also feel like um, sometimes these people are just there and maybe sad that they just walk in and see people like you pushing buttons. On I push the, the buttons. Difference. Yes. And like, yeah, that's cool that the kiosk is there. Maybe I'm overthinking it. And maybe they're like, thank gosh, he's doing it this way because now I don't have to do any work. But like, I actually enjoy the conversation. I'm maybe I'm one of the few that still enjoys the human element of going to a restaurant, even if it's limited service. But I like talking to the people. I mean, there are there's there there are upsides to talking to people. Sometimes you get better yeah. prices if the if the prices haven't been updated in both right. places. And, uh, typically, uh, on the kiosk, it's going to be more expensive. Uh, you could also ask for things to be personalized in different ways. So, like, yes, there are upsides to doing it. I personally, I like the kiosks. I don't I don't need to interact with people if I don't need if I don't have to. I guess I'm a little introverted when it comes to that stuff. But See, I'll moreover, tell this, I'll tell you this story though, because this has to do with kiosk versus in person. When I was moving to Texas, I took a trip through Arkansas and I stopped at a Wendy's. My dad's a big Wendy's fan and they have the kiosks in Wendy's. They're not like the up and down kiosks like McDonald has. It's usually just basically an iPad that's right there. So I could either type it into the iPad or I can just look up and have a conversation with you. So I start talking to the woman who is behind the counter. I order everything. She says, you know what? You guys told me your story. Here's free Frosties for everybody. Free Frosties for everybody, right? Great. I love it. Then I notice, hey, we're missing, you know, a four piece chicken nugget. She says, oh, you missed four pieces. All right. I'll take care of that. Here's 40 pieces chicken nugget, right? Not that everybody's going to do this. I do believe this is like a Southern hospitality thing. And she wanted to make the best trip for us. And it was like, supposed to be was, a 10 piece. I don't think <laughs> it was supposed to, I mean, it was, but it was like an incredible experience. And like, it was one of those things where we actually went out of our way. And like, because of that, we gave her a $50 tip. The whole meal was like $36, but we gave her a $50 tip. Her personally, we said like, we want to give you this tip. Now, if I'm just typing into a machine, I lose that human element and I don't really get to do that. But I, I do feel like there is a certain nature about us as humans that does crave that interpersonal connection and that human interaction. And with that, we got to meet someone that was super cool. We got to bless them a little bit more by giving them this tip. But we also got a bunch of free stuff too. I'm not going to pretend like I don't love free stuff. It was awesome. Free Frosties for everybody. A ton of extra food. We had a great time. And like the adventure was amazing. This was, you know, it could have been such a minor story. This right. Wendy's could have totally been something that I never thought about again. But here I am months later still thinking about it because it made that much of a difference. Well, unfortunately, as long as uh, economic metrics, economic metrics do not change, as long as they remain unchanged, and the government continues to interfere the way it does, and corporations continue to be corporations, and uh, yeah. corporatism remains as strong as it does, uh, that's all going to keep going away, because businesses are going to adapt when they get attacked. Right. And, and businesses seem to, corporations seem to keep... Uh, also playing the offense, going for profits over people. And so now you have just more machines taking over in restaurants where you're, you are losing that human interaction. And I that's know. going to keep happening. They're either going to shut the doors or throw out all the people. You know what I want to see, though? And this would be amazing. I actually had a dream about this last night. So this is really funny. I want to take the Mark Cuban business model of cost plus drugs. That's where he basically 
works with manufacturers to get generic prices on or generic drugs, takes the pricing and adds 15%. And that's the cost. I want that model to trickle into other things. That 15% profit margin is healthy. Maybe it's, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 25%, whatever it might be. But we see so many companies that when you actually look at it, it's like a 600% profit margin. Coffee, Starbucks. Starbucks is making like 785% profit on every yes. cup of coffee they sell. Yes. It's greed. It is absolute greed. And yeah, the taste might be good, but the business knows that they can charge you more without losing anything. They've got so much runway to give. Why can we not make things more affordable at a 15 agreed upon 15 to 20% profit margin? And if the cost goes up, you incrementally increase it to then allow to continue that 15 to 25% profit margin moving forward. Folks, there is a massive difference. And look, look at our chat, look at our comments. Sometimes there are a lot of people that are saying things. They have no clue what they're talking about. Uh, we, we're nice. We want to be nice. We want them to learn something. Corporatism is very different from being a business owner. Being yes. a business owner is not a corporation. It is not, you don't have the big board. You don't have the, they're starkly different. And I wish more people would understand that, especially small business ownership. Small business yeah. ownership is massively different from corporatism. And that's the government intervention is usually to try to combat corporatism. Mm hmm which then ends up hurting everybody because that's you're not curbing corporatism. You're just attacking. You're whenever the government intervenes, they're punching down. They claim to be punching up, but they're actually punching down because they're not solving the problem. Why? Because they're best friends with all the corporates, the, the corporate <laughs> schmucks anyway. So it's just a big problem. And if you don't believe they're friends with corporate schmucks, take a look at why the California minimum rate minimum wage doesn't affect limited service restaurants with bakeries oh i can one up that look at nancy pelosi's stock portfolio <laughs> well <laughs> that's true too that's true too she's Insider never trading. lost <laughs> <laughs> she is the best gambler i've ever seen <laughs> yeah and day trading is totally legal for those people but not to go into that route not to go that direction well you know what no let's go in that direction oh <laughs> let's go in that direction is there a place for politics in business? Is there a place for um, political insight and, and insider knowledge where it makes sense for politics to be so heavily ingrained in the decision-making of these corporations? And obviously every corporation doesn't have the same regulations, but this minimum wage hike was a government mandated thing. Should government be the one that's deciding that? Should we should politics be the ones that are deciding that? Or do we as a people have to, you know, stand up, push back? Do Like, what does that look like? Well, so yeah, it, it comes down to the people who you elect. And then if you elect people that are corrupt, and unfortunately, they're all corrupt. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the problem. With, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. I'm neither for a reason. They're both bad. Yeah. They're both they're both the, the corrupt side of the same coin. So... It doesn't matter if how you know a politician is lying. Well, they're speaking, right? And so, unfortunately, so so what do you do about that? The best you can, you live smart, you live economical, you 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 pay attention to what's happening, and you combat when when the the jabs come. You learn how to block and duck. That's just how it's going to have to be. I think that's how it's always going to be until every they say that the economy is great. They're lying. It is great for the rich. It is not yeah. great for the mi the middle class. is is just disappearing faster and faster and faster. It is not good for the blue collar workers. I don't care who you are. It's just not. It's just not good. This is the worst time ever to buy a house. This is the uh, one of the worst times to try to buy a car. It's it's only this much better than it was during covid to get to get a vehicle it had that those prices haven't come down the the pharmaceutical industry still caught they're making 600 percent profit you can't oh, even yeah. get a coffee without spending ten dollars so who's it good for it's not really good for anybody so what do you what do you do about that vote 
Vote where vote with your heart, be educated, and vote. We're not telling you who to vote for or what I like I just said, we're clearly not taking sides on a political faction. But I wanna now jumping back to businesses, you shouldn't be taking a side on a political faction. You should vote personally. But this is something I've I've wanted to make a video about for a while. I'm sick and tired of businesses taking political affiliation, p political faction positions. Absolutely, I think it is stupid. It is, and it's irresponsible. And it's irresponsible for you to come out and endorse a politician. It's irresponsible for you to come out and endorse a political party. That party doesn't care about you. Those politicians mm -hmm. don't care about you. You think the president cares? You know, you, you, that president doesn't know who you are. They're never going to defend you. They're, they don't care about you. But you know who does? Your customers. They yeah. care about who that endorsement is going to. It is a massive factor. And when you live in a country like the United States, where there generally is a 50-50 in political affiliations, in political party affiliations, when you plant a flag and say, this is my guy, this is my girl, this is my person, 50% of the country says, I don't like you anymore. Yeah. We live in divisive times. We live in absolutely divisive, dangerous times. And, and when you plant that flag, you're turning people off. And you know what? They don't forget. Just this past week, Dwayne Johnson comes out and says that he regrets endorsing Joe Biden in the 2020 election and yeah. that he's not going to be doing it this year and likely ever again. But you know why? Because people don't like Dwayne Johnson anymore. He's lost <laughs> the right leaning uh, 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 fandom to fandom. Yeah. He's lost the right. Dwayne Johnson, the movie star, has lost followers on the right. You know what? He doesn't care about them. You know, in the aspect that they're right, he cares that they're not paying for his movies anymore. Right. They're not. They're not going to go see his his films anymore, whether they're good or bad. You've now lost fans. Permit. You have stained your reputation. You could be as right leaning as you want. You could be as left leaning as you want, and it goes both sides. I have another example in a second. It doesn't matter when when people know what political side you stand on because we live in such divisive times, it carries weight. Now let's look at the other side. That was somebody on the left. Look at, let's look at somebody on the right. Kid Rock. Kid Rock comes out shooting Bud Light cans because of the um, everything that happened with Bud Light. I forget. What, what's the, the, the name? The, the Bud Light campaign. Oh, I don't remember. I don't know. I I don't remember the, the the name, the endorsement. That I don't remember who that was. Um, shooting with a gun, Bud Light campaigns, uh, uh, Bud Bud Light cans. Who on the left is ever going to support Kid Rock again? Now, granted, he had already done things that were against the left, so he was already not a fan. But now, think about it. Who who on the left is gonna is gonna be a fan of Kid Rock? I don't see anyone. Uh, right. Be it you know you're not going to be very forgiving of that mm -hmm. right it goes both ways but what we want to i think you're, you're trying to bridge into is uh somebody who i would say is not a, a trump republican uh but is and is probably a little more left leaning but it's jamie Dimon. so jamie Dimon came out recently and he and he's been on record a few times lately and i'm very interested in this. I, I like to hear what he has to say, and he's been saying things more and more that I like. I'm going to share this tab. It's the Jamie Dimon wars. Now, Jamie Dimon, he's the, the JP Morgan CEO, warns that inflation and interest rates may remain elevated. Okay, that's not good. And then he goes on to say, and he's talked about this multiple times, he's gone on to discuss how the economy is not great for for the middle class and lower and that the the country's too divided and we need to start bridging those gaps we need to stop being so aggressive against those political factions you know you you shouldn't be hating on each other and what's the best way to do that uh stop talking about it yeah you know stop talk go vote there's a reason, like, I, I don't I don't know, Isaac, if you have the same situation as me, but, like, when I, where I go to vote, there's the curtain. You pull a curtain mm -hmm. over yourself. Right. Uh, or there's the, the table that comes up high so no one can see what your vote yeah. is. Do that. Do that. You know, like, do, do it, for business owners. Do that. Don't tell anybody what your, what your political affiliation is. I also want to put a little caveat on this because 
there's going to be some people that are like, no, I, I want to do it. I got I got to say what I want. You have every right. Not telling you not to do something, just giving you advice it may not be in your best interest to do it. But if you have the, you, you're like, no, these, these points I need to talk about, you talk about them. Also, but my whole brand is around politics. God bless. Good for you. You know, make, make as much <laughs> money as you can. But at the same time, just know that it, it, all of those things come at a cost. So that's my take on, on politics and business. What are your thoughts? Wow. I mean, you just said a lot. I, <laughs> there's, I there's... wrote a script for this about 17 <laughs> times. I've been trying to do a video on this. I'm glad we were, we were able to fit that one in there. So now you guys, you know, watch all of our other videos since you don't have to watch that as a separate video now. Oh, well, no, it's now it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Watch just, that video too. Here, I just cut the clip right here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, I, I grew up in a place where uh, politics wasn't heavily discussed. And I, I was kind of raised with the philosophy that like, if you work hard enough, politics can be something that don't really impact you because it doesn't matter what side or what person is in the office, uh, you can still win either way. So I, I agree with that. It's, I mean, it's worked for me. Not that I'm like the prime example of someone that's winning and, you know, I don't drive a special car. I don't live in a special house. I don't like have this amazing, incredibly special life, but I do understand that it doesn't matter how hard the news pushes one thing, I have always figured out a way to be okay and to find happiness in the things that I do. I remember when I was a freshman in college, I started to tell everybody because I noticed a lot of the people that I was with, they would say, I'm so unhappy, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, whatever it may be. And yes, those are very real. And I want to give the credibility and the weight to Absolutely. anybody that's experiencing those things. That's some that's real talk. I never had those things because what I told myself was I want to make sure every single thing that I'm doing, I'm happy. And it originates from Steve jobs. He said, if you do the same thing for too many days in a row and you find yourself not enjoying it, you have to change it up. Right. I always wanted to make sure that I was doing what made me happy. And I I've continued to live that philosophy throughout my life. So I think I've avoided a lot of those mental health conditions because I trained myself from a very early age, continue to find reasons to be happy, continue to find reasons to smile, continue to find, even if it's not a big win where it's not like I made a million dollars and I can compare to everybody on social media, I found reasons to make myself happy. It can be a small win. It can be a little thing that I enjoyed every day. But having those things involved zero politics. I was able to be happy. I was able to enjoy my life. I was able to study and learn and be friends with people, politics aside. So yeah, I mean, politics are real and they're, they're never going to go away. It's always going to be there. But at the same time, I know that it can be something that doesn't have to have as big of an impact as a lot of people give it credit for. Now, I just want to, I want to give like a quick, very quick story about how I can speak to every, every range of um, person here. Summer of 2017. We're, we're now wearing Prototopics hats. You obviously have heard of Prototopics if you have made it this far into the video. Prototopics started out as an education company in Miami. And if you want all of the details behind it, go on to prototopics.com. We've got an article about how it was started and where it came from. It started out as an education company in Miami. And the way that it started was totally on accident. I was supposed to be working a job in Philadelphia over the summer. They reached out to me 72 hours before and they said, we lost funding. We no longer have the, the funding for you. Sorry. So now my entire summer plans when I was you know, in college was gone within a matter of seconds. So I called my sister who lived in Miami and I said, I don't have anything. I need to start out with something. And she said, okay, come down here and live with me. I said, I don't really have that much money. I have you know, $1,100. She said, that's enough to get started. And that statement right there was like, okay, great. Let's figure this out head on, right? We're going through. We're going to see what happens. Move to Miami, rents $500 a month. So I have $500 for two months if that's all I had to pay for. That's not all I had to pay for. Pay for one month of rent, pay to file for the company, which was $250. Ink file is a scam. Never use them. And <laughs> please don't sponsor our video later, Ink file. And... Um, <laughs> 
And then I had to figure out a way to eat, right? But when you've only got at that point $400 to last you for the next three months, you're living off of nothing. I was eating Dollar Tree food. Like I didn't even know Dollar Tree had a food section, a freezer section. I was eating rice and I was eating dollar store food for three to four months. So if people come and say now, well, like, oh, you've got technology, you've got a following, you've got this and this and that. I've lived with nothing. I played with a tennis ball. My sister and I would throw a tennis ball back and forth because that is only thing that we could afford when we were doing it. And you know what? I would not change that for the world. It doesn't have to go with politics. It doesn't have to go with personality. It doesn't have to go with anything. I've experienced what it is to be at what many people would consider to be the lowest of low. And I've experienced that same summer, I've experienced people that I worked with and interacted with that were multimillionaires that were working in high rises, driving Porsche 911s to the office every single day. We see people that we know people that right now spend $1,500, $15,000 on a Rolex that claim they can't afford anything, <laughs> but spend all this money on stuff. So we well, get true. all sides of the spectrum. <laughs> we get all sides of the spectrum. Politics are always going to be there. They're never going to go away. But the yes. way you choose to let them impact you is very, very important. So I say that as a, a point of relatability. If it's the money that you're you're having a hard time with, there's always another way to do it. If it's the human interaction, there's always another person to talk to. If it's the time, the resources, whatever, it's it's all within your reach. So I know we've talked about a lot of different things here, and this ended up a lot more philosophical than we intended. I'm glad but, it did, though. I but, think it was yeah, needed. it's it's valuable. Like I said, this one's going to be the most fun one that we've had. It turned in from the most fun in the beginning to the most philosophical one. Yeah, we needed I want one like people this. to understand that the value in your life is not always determined based on your belief system. It's based on the experiences that you have and what you can do in the world. Continue to find reasons to smile. Continue to find reasons to make other people smile. We're all humans at the end of the day. We're all people that want what's best for everybody at the end of the day. Let's have fun with it. Let's enjoy it. Let's make the most of it. I, I think that was a really good way to, to, to wrap things up. I think that was really good. So with that, we're going to tie up today's episode, today's podcast. Uh, and for those of you who are part of our members, our Innovators Club, we'll see you in the Members Club video very soon. Thank you for being part of that. And thank you for watching the Prototopics podcast. Until next time, create, innovate, and inspire.